So what is cation exchange capacity? Um, the definition is it's the amount of negative charge in the soil that attracts positively charged ions. And the diagram here is just an illustration of uh, how we might uh, view it. So a clay crystal, we can consider it's got negative charges on it. And it's got negative charges because of the, uh, the makeup of the crystal itself. We don't need to go into the details of where that negative charge comes from, but clays in general are going to have a negative charge. And therefore cations, which are these uh, charged species, are attracted. It's like the magnets. Uh, the poles, two opposite poles attract, in this case the negative and the positive attract. So around the surface of the clay you're going to have these cations. And the cation exchange capacity is a measure of how much negative charge which tells you its ability to attract the cations and also its ability to tr attract water. So this is part of the basis for uh, water holding in the soil as well. And of course there are many different types of uh, dissolved ions in the soil and I've divided them here into those that have one charge from those that have two charges and those that have three charges. The aluminium has three charges and that sticks much more strongly onto the surface than those that had two charges like calcium and magnesium and the potassium, sodium and ammonium are most weakly held by the soil and therefore these are the ones that are going to leach most easily from a soil. Um, soil scientists have an interesting terminology for measuring the amount of cation exchange uh, but basically it's the amount of charge per weight of soil and uh, different soil tests will report it in different units either centimoles per kilogram or milli equivalents per hundred grams but basically it's charge per unit weight of soil and different labs will give you different ways of uh, assessing cation exchange the standard tests measure the cation exchange after they increase the pH of the soil to 7. Most soils don't have a pH of 7. So there's automatically a, a bit of an artifact in the result um, because when you increase the pH you actually increase the cation exchange capacity as I'll show later. So the standard tests actually over report or overestimate the real amount of cation exchange in the soil. And uh, they tend to suggest that there's also hydrogen ions part of the cation exchange, which is really just an artifact of the test. The alternative way is what we called effective cation exchange, and I'll show you how we calculate <laughs> that shortly. It's basically just adding up the amount of calcium, magnesium, potassium, sodium, and any other cations that are in the soil, including the aluminium. So let's go back to this as the same soil test results that we looked at uh, earlier, just focusing on the cations. So the main cations measured in this soil, aluminium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. And if we just add up those, we get this bottom figure which is the effective cation exchange capacity. And you can see in both of these soils the top soil has a very high cation ex exchange capacity compared to the subsoil and the texture is not different but the organic matter is hugely different between those two layers. So I think that's telling us in that soil where most of the cation exchange capacity is coming from. It's coming from the organic matter. So that's one way in which uh, we can assess cation exchange. How can we use that information? This is the same results. Now we're focusing on the exchangeable sodium and the effective cation exchange capacity that we just calculated. And we make a ratio of those two and come up with what's called an ESP. Not extrasensory perception, but exchangeable sodium percentage. So it's sodium divided by ECEC, 
as a percentage and the interesting one is this soil which has a value of 8%. That puts it in a, a borderline zone where it's potentially dispersive so that when you wet up the soil uh, the clays have it, will have a tendency to uh, melt or disperse and clog up the pores which might affect the drainage. We're going to see the profile and uh, Jenny's got some field tests on that to see whether in fact that is the case. Uh, probably it won't because this particular soil also had a slightly higher conductivity and the conductivity tends to keep the clays flocculated even though it's got reasonably high exchangeable sodium. Another aspect of the cations that's important is to look at the aluminium. Um, I mentioned the pH of this, uh, the subsoils are uh, around about 5 and uh, drifting below 5. We can form a ratio between the exchangeable aluminium and the ECEC to get what we call the aluminium saturation. So when that value is greater than 20, sensitive plants that are sensitive to acidity can be damaged by aluminium. So that's uh, another aspect of cation exchange that's important for managing soils, the whole issue of aluminium toxicity. So that's about cation exchange and uh, some of the ratios of cations to cation exchange that are important. I wanted to step back a little bit about what are some of the important soil properties that we need to uh, think about in addition to cation exchange and relate them all together. We normally divide soil properties into uh, physical, chemical and biological, although in truth they're all interrelated to one another. All of these properties are very strongly influenced by the surface area in the soil and the reactive nature of the surfaces. Here's an example. If you just divide the particles making up the soil, um, and uh, look at, um, based on particle size, uh, how many different particles would be present. So a gram of soil, which will just fit on your fingernail, contains very few sand particles, contains huge numbers of clay cells, crystals. The importance of that is surface area. If we divide these, um, uh, the sand, silt and clay that make up the soil and look at their surface area, the coarse sand and fine sand contribute very, very negligible amounts of surface area to the soil. So they're not reacting with uh, the fertiliser, with the, uh, the nutrients in the soil to any great extent. The clays and the humus can have a huge reactive surface. So just think about this, uh, humus, 900 square metres per gram. So the amount of soil that fits on your fingernail, 30 metres by 30 metres of surface area, so bigger than this room, in a gram of soil. So it's got a huge capacity to uh, uh, react with uh, whatever's in the soil, all of the dissolved substances, the, uh, the fertiliser that you add. And very small differences in the amount of clay and humus in the soil therefore dominate a lot of the behaviour of a soil. Uh, we have a lot of sands in Western Australia and one sand might have 2% clay, another might have 6% and it's not a huge difference but actually it's more than a threefold difference in the amount of reactive surface that's holding nutrients, that's holding water and uh, influencing soil behaviour. And that surface area is correlated with cation exchange. Um, I didn't fill all of this table up, but basically the more surface area in the clays, the more cation exchange. And most of our soils in Western Australia and the southwest have the kaolinite type of clays um, rather than the uh, smectite type clays. So their surface area and cation exchange is relatively modest 
Um, and whereas the organic matter has a very high reactive surface area, so a lot of our reactivity in soils and our ability to hold nutrients is uh, related to organic matter. So you need to listen up to what Fran's got to say. Um, some other evidence of this, this is from um, a collection of soils in the southwest of Western Australia and it's relating the cation exchange capacity to the organic carbon and you can see for most of the soils it's a nice straight line. More organic matter, more cation exchange, except for this bunch of soils here which we don't have very many of, these are the ones that have the um, smectite type clays, these are the swelling shrinking type clays and there are some of those on the coastal plain but they're not that uh, common. Now we've talked about uh, the cation exchange which is the cations held around the clay by the negative charges but then there are all these other ions in the solution because um, the clay is bathed in a solution, the soil water is a solution that contains a whole bunch of uh, ions and uh, dissolved organic material and the like. And so these are swirling around and the cation exchange is just the, uh, the uh, movement of ions from the solution to the surface and back again. And that's influenced by plants taking some of those ions up. Uh, by mineralization of organic matter that releases some more into the soil. Uh, you put some fertilizer in and it uh, increases the concentration of some of those uh, ions and not others. And so the cation exchange is that uh, continual exchange between the solution and the, uh, the soil surfaces. Where does this um, charge come from? Well for the solids crystal that make up the clays, it's actually a property of the clay, it's just part of the mineralogy, how it's made up. Um, but there's also what we call variable charge in soils. And the variable charge changes with the pH. As the pH increases you get more negative charge or more cation exchange capacity. So this is uh, just an example from some Queensland soils but uh, it will occur in Western Australian soils as well. Cation exchange against pH. As the pH increases, the cation exchange increases. So this is why measuring cation exchange in the lab at pH 7, if the natural soil pH is not 7, gives you an overestimate. It's not the, the real cation exchange that's affecting what's happening in the soil. And the amount of um, permanent and variable charge depends on the material. So for organic matter, most of it is variable. So you change the pH and you change the cation exchange of the organic matter. For clays, most of the char for um, the smectite type clays, most of the charge is permanent, it's in the crystal, can't be changed. Uh, for kaolin, it's the other way around, there's a lot more variable charge. This is a, a visualization of organic matter. Uh, organic matter has these um, uh, what we call functional groups on the surface. Um, when it's a more acidic environment, these are relatively neutral when it becomes the pH increases you get a lot more negative charges on the surface there and obviously the cations are now able to lat latch onto those uh, negative charges so the uh, cation exchange of the uh, organic matter is affected by the pH. So is it possible to increase the cation exchange capacity of a soil? Can we go out and buy a truckload of it and put it on the soil if it's so good? Well, we've just explored that we can increase cation exchange by increasing the pH. And early on, we could see that higher organic matter in the soil will increase the cation exchange capacity. And the third possibility is to increase the clay content of the soil. And um, these are some slides uh, courtesy of uh, David Hall, who works with the Department of Agriculture in um, Esperance. 
And of course on water repellent soils, adding clay is a treatment that's uh, now commonly used. There's something like 100,000 hectares out in the wheat belt has uh, been clayed in order to reduce water repellents. And um, that's using big and fairly serious uh, equipment. The actual uh, costs of that are in the order of uh, eight, nine hundred dollars per hectare. But um, we've been involved with some research down at Esperance where over a 15 year period, uh, the clay treatment has uh, produced um, 40 to 60 percent increase in uh, crop yields consistently right through that 15 year period. So the payback is three to six years, depending on uh, profitability of the crops. Uh, it's a fairly serious investment, but it is a permanent change to the cation exchange capacity of the soil. As shown here, these are David's data, where the subsoil addition is going up to 300 tonnes, and you can see that that's increased the cation exchange capacity of the soil by 60% or thereabouts. Uh, also increased the organic carbon content and the clay has gone from 1 to 7%. Uh, cations are also important for physical properties of soils. Um, soils, in addition to having sand, silt and clay, um, will form secondary particles we call aggregates or PEDs and I think out in the field Jenny's going to show us some of those which is basically the sand, the clay and the organic matter clumped together and cations help to hold that together, particularly calcium. So if we've got too much sodium, these aggregates tend to melt. They lose their strength and uh, that changes the porosity of the soil and uh, damages its drainage. Calcium is highly beneficial for flocculation and uh, holding those PEDs together strongly. Magnesium is not as effective as calcium and the combination of soil organic matter and uh, uh, calcium really helps to stabilise this structure and make it uh, much more persistent. Um, I want to talk a little bit about cation ratios. Um, there are some ratios that are particularly useful for um, uh, interpreting what's happening in a soil. The exchangeable sodium percentage is a ratio of sodium to uh, ECEC. That's quite a useful diagnostic in the soil to tell us about structure stability and whether we need to add gypsum. Uh, aluminium relative to cation exchange, the aluminium saturation tells us about acidity limitations and whether we need to add lime. The ratios of other cations can be important at extremes because they may indicate uh, deficiencies are possible and therefore we need to adjust the fertiliser program. The question whether there's an ideal ratio of calcium to magnesium to potassium, there's a, a bit of literature out there suggesting that there is an ideal ratio. There's a great paper by uh, Peter Kapitke and Neil Menzies, I've got copies of it, reviews that whole literature thoroughly going right back to actually the 19th century when the idea first came up through the work in the US in the 1940s and 50s when it was first uh, popularised and published and the conclusion is there's no evidence that there is an ideal ratio. Here's an example. On the right, the ideal ratio suggested is 6.5. Uh, here's an example of an experiment actually from the US, from Bayer, who was one of the originators of the concept. The ratio is varying from 3 up to nearly 15. No difference in crop yield. Uh, Wanfer put in a trial out at uh, Meckering, uh, ran it for about six years with a similar calcium to magnesium ratio, no difference in crop yield. Um, here's some results from Neil Menzies lab where if you look at the calcium saturation, 60 to 70 is supposed to be the ideal. Root growth is fine all the way down to 10% calcium saturation. It's only at the extremes when these are actually suffering from calcium deficiency 
that the growth is actually affected. So the ratio concept doesn't really seem to have any scientific validity. Let's just uh, draw this together now. Um, we've, the topic is cation exchange, but actually it's just one of many, many properties of soils that are important. The acidity and the aluminium saturation, the, the organic matter, the levels of some of the key nutrients, uh, things like electrical conductivity and sodium percentage. But we also need to pay attention to what's in the profile, the nature of the profile. Uh, what's the depth of rooting? Uh, these can be very easy diagnostics done in the field, and I think Jenny's going to uh, lead us through an example there that can have some very crucial information in them. And it might tell us that we've got an acidity layer. Um, if we've got a huge amount of gravel in the soil, that's a, a significant factor. This bottom example here was from a, a um, vineyard uh, near Ballarat. Uh, where for years they had really struggling grapevines and they kept adjusting the fertiliser program, kept adjusting the irrigation program and could never get a decent production of their grapes until somebody said, let's get a backhoe and have a look at the profile, which they did. And basically they found that the roots were growing in 30 centimetres of uh, sand and then it was on this super dense subsoil through which no roots were growing. That's the problem. And uh, so all of the investment in uh, um, fertilizers and irrigation was pretty much wasted um, until they realized what was uh, below. And then of course there are plant tests that can tell us a lot as well, particularly for micronutrients. Here's some, a snapshot of um, where some soil tests, uh, uh, the sort of general constraints that are um, prevalent in pastures and dairy soils. There was a paper published by David Weaver and uh, Mike Wong. They got a hold from CSBP of about 110,000 soil samples done over a three year period, um, 2008 to 2010. And then they analysed those soil samples to see where did they fit in terms of critical phosphorus. And 90% of the dairy soils that they sampled had above the critical phosphorus level, which means that adding phosphorus fertilizer to those soils is not going to increase yield. Your phosphorus fertilizer in those soils needs to be targeted to maintaining levels rather than increasing them. Two thirds of the soils, however, were acid and 10% uh, were low in potassium. Uh, significant, uh, over 50% of the soils had high phosphorus and also were acid. So the investment in those soils probably should be towards liming and changing the pH rather than adding more phosphorus. And there are other soils where the phosphorus level is high um, but the potassium is low. So that's quite a, an interesting snapshot across the dairy industry of where some of the focus should be in terms of uh, soil constraints. Let me just wrap up now. Cation exchange. Um, it is a significant property of soils. Um, it's an, a general description of some of the important properties of a soil because it tells us about the surface area, which is where most of the reactions in the soil are taking place tells us about the reactivity to cations and to water and it also tells us something about the capacity of the soil to uh, uh, retain organic matter in the soil. However, not many of our on-farm decisions are based purely on cation exchange capacity. Our decisions tend to be more on things like what are the levels of cations? So do we have evidence of low levels of potassium or magnesium or calcium, the individual cations? Is there evidence that there's too much sodium or too much aluminium? So the focus really in terms of soil management is on the individual cations rather than the cation exchange itself. And cation exchange is just one of many properties that are important in the soil, organic matter, the nutrients. Um, and we need to remember that 
to look at the whole profile and understand where's the root zone and what are the constraints in the whole root zone, not just the, uh, the top 10 centimetres. And uh, for all of this, there's a lot of uh, information out there. Um, Rob referred earlier to the soil quality handout sheets. So there's a, a website where you can get hold of those. There's one about cation exchange as well as others. And uh, DAFRA has a lot of uh, information relevant to uh, uh, management of uh, dairy pastures and dairy soils. And I've just uh, referred to a link there as an example. So that's my brief overview of cation exchange in the context of uh, soil management. So, thank, thank you. you very much, Richard. Just a hand for Richard there.